be here today to join you. And I just want to repeat what I repeated earlier before we get started. If you have questions or things that you would like to ask of the panelists, if you type them into the chat, I will make sure to review the chat and be able to post the questions to them as we move through our conversation. And that way, and you won't forget what your question is if you sort of like get in a word in while we're talking with each other. Um, I'd also like to <laughs> something nice to say to the panelists. Uh, you can also type that too. It doesn't necessarily have to be questions. It's sometimes nice to hear from people uh, if they just want to give compliments or props to the people who are involved. Uh, both in the film, but also in the movement of sovereignty locally. Um, I'm going to begin today with an introduction of myself. So I'm Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy. I am the Department Chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State. I'm also Hoopa Yurik and Kaduk and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, and I'm joining you today from, uh, near Baduat or in McKinleyville, California, but on Wiat lands, on uh, unceded Wiat territory. And I'm really honored to be on this panel with um, really like a, a lot of Native youth, like the next generation that's going to be coming up and leading this food sovereignty movement. And uh, I'm going to let the panelists start by introducing themselves. And then we uh, have a couple questions prepared. But in between, I'll be looking at the questions that people are submitting and also posing some of those. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity to hear from each of these uh, young people about what they're doing right now to sort of support and uplift um, food sovereignty in our region. And I, I want to say that this is uh, probably the third time that I've seen this film, but each time uh, it gives me like a great sense of hope for all the things that we're about to accomplish in our communities and, and from the space of our peoples finally saying like, this is how we want to take charge of the narrative and then what we want to do with our spaces. And, and then I also see a lot of excitement about food, which I think, you know, like the love, the love that comes through food is very important to indigenous communities. Uh, when I was growing up, if I went to my grandma's house, like the first thing she did was say, I have to feed you, here's some food, here's what I have, here's what I'm making for you. And it reminded me very clearly how much I was tied the place that I was from. And in Hoopa, we say, when we um, talk about people, we say that people are kunyatyan. And uh, what that means is that we're human beings. That's what it means. It's like we're human beings. But what it actually means is that we're acorn eaters. And in Hoopa, we said, if you wanted to be a human being, you ate acorns. And that's how you became human. And I think that that's really important because I see our acorns and our ties to our histories coming together, but also the ways in which we thought about personhood beyond borders, because people throughout California ate acorns, people throughout the Southwest ate acorns. And we talked about native people, Indian people as acorn eaters. And now when I work with our youth, I make a real, um, I really make a real effort to reconnect our youth to acorns and to think about the ways in which they can understand acorns as part of their everyday lives. And I see how uh, at first they're a little bit hesitant to reconnect to some of their indigenous foods. They're not used to them. They haven't seen them in many spaces sometimes. Um, but the more that they see other people get very engaged with what indigenous foods are and why they're so important to us, they become very tied to and excited about their indigenous foods. And so I, I'm very honored to be here with uh, these panelists tonight. And I wanna give them each a chance to introduce themselves before we get started. And so um, we'll begin with Sammy. Uh, uh, if you want to introduce yourself, Sammy, to everyone who's here. Um, I Nakichu, Nek now Sammy Jinsaw, Rekwa, Metwamechok. I come from the village of uh, Rekwa. I am the founding director of the Ancestral Guard. And I'm also the uh, vice chairman of the Yurok Tribes Natural Resources Committee. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And then uh, Marlena. All right. So me, I'm Nonantang Marlena Dusek Yaka, Pi Ayukuisham, Pi Kupinguish, Pi Ipai, Pi Latina, Pi Czech, Shungal. 
um, Ayalanik Polovito, Piangmai, Amayam Pokwan, Ataham Pokwan, the Mayawat Pokwan, Nohaya, Pi Cham, Payangmai, Chipoli, Meet Chaonam. So, hello to all. My name is Marlena Dusek. I come from the Paiyukuichum people, the Kumiai people, the Kupa people. I'm Latina and also a Czech woman. Um, and I said it is good it, with good intentions always for the children, for the people, and for the earth that I come. And this is what we must always remember. Um, I currently am a graduate student in the Environment and Community Program at Humboldt State. I also graduated with my undergrad in Environmental Management and Policy from Humboldt State with a minor in Native American Studies. Um, I currently work for Trinidad Rancheria as an Environmental and Cultural Resource Technician but I also work on um, a few other different projects in regards to food sovereignty um, for my local community, but also here in the local community. So thank you for having me today, I appreciate it. Thank you, Marlena. Cody? Yeah, Kali do. Cody Henriksen Ilan Shida, Dananach U Sukpia Kilan Shida, Shukoya Hidi Nanamchik Kilan. Hello everyone, my name is Cody Henriksen. I am a Denaina and Sukpiak and an enrolled member of the Ninilchik Village Tribe. I come from Yalkanen or um, the Kenai Peninsula in, in Alaska. Um, I am an undergraduate in, at Humboldt State University, major, double majoring in marine biology and Native American studies. I'm also on the steering committee for the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Lab and was also one of the student researchers for the creation of the um, Food Sovereignty Lab. And I'm really happy to be joining you all today. And my professional and personal interests lie with um, marine cultural resources and marine traditional foods. Uh, Chikanik. So as I said, we have a, a panel of young people who are doing this work right now and are really um, leading the way for this conversation and what this can become and what this will be for the future generations. Um, we wanted to begin tonight with Sammy, since he is featured in the film, and I think that it's really important to hear from him directly. And we're very, very fortunate that he is doing this work in this area and that uh, he continues to do it and continues to dedicate himself to that. Um, and so, Sammy, if you have anything you'd like to share in reflection on watching the film now that it, you know, it's time has passed and where things are at today, or if there's anything in particular that you wanted to highlight either about the film or the continuing issues that are happening in the film, we want to give you a moment to kind of reflect as somebody who was in the film and, and we have just watched it. Right on. Well, I hope everybody got an opportunity to enjoy the film. And uh, one thing that you may notice, I started to grow, grow my hair out. When COVID first uh, started hitting communities, I said, well, I'll just start growing my hair out, you know, for personal reasons. And I'll get a haircut when it's over. And, you know, here we are over 200 days in. And so I finally decided just to grow my hair out. And um, watching the film, that's one thing that I think of instantly. But another thing I like to share with people, a little fun fact is... Uh, we all know Renan and Sanjay are excellent filmmakers, but also um, Chaz, there's a sound guy and he actually worked on Shark Week, a little fun fact before. So I like to share that with people. Um, but some of the things that we're working on in the film, it's exciting to see the film because we did start filming about three years ago and the advancements we've made in our programming and our opportunity to bring tangible resources to families in, in, on the lower Klamath River um, has changed so much and I'm so thankful for all the people like you know Vesper Society and uh, Native Americans of Philanthropy who gave us the opportunity to really share our programming with our communities. So that's something I always like to start out with that this work is super important for not only us to do but for everybody to um, kind of realize how important it is in their community even if they aren't tribally affiliated themselves. And Sammy, do you have any um, like updates you think people should know about things going on with salmon in our region or anything that's happening right now that you think people on the, on the Zoom should know about in uh, your country? So just recently, everybody has been worrying on the FERC decision. And the FERC decision is basically them saying that it's okay for Pacific Corps 
um, the Federal Regular Regulatory Energy Commission. They're saying giving permission for Pacific Core to transfer ownership of the dams to a nonprofit organization that has accumulated money from the state of California and also through Pacific Core up to around four hundred and fifty million dollars. And FERC said, "Well, we're not going to let you transfer." Um, these dams over completely. And we do want you to be held accountable if something were to go wrong. So you have to pay some of these fees and well, and that from the beginning, Pacific Corps said that's something that they absolutely did not want to do. So really it was just a stalling tactic implemented on our people to stop these dams from coming down. And that's my personal beliefs. I also um, believe that them doing so is not going to stop these dams from coming down. What we need to realize is that there is so many people that have their eyes have been opened over the past years due to the numerous protests and community members and activists who have dedicated their time and their lives and put everything on their line um, to make sure that these dams come down. So over these past years, we've seen advancements in our position where we can say, um, we're comfortable saying that these dams are going to come down no matter what, no matter what the stalling tactic is. Um, our communities depend on this river too much to give up now. And I, I had one more follow-up question for you, Sammy. The, the little boy that's in the film with you, um, they didn't really give an introduction to who he is or how he, or like what was going on. Do you often bring like young people out with you to do those kinds of activities? Is that something that that you still do and that, that, that the Ancestral Guard is involved in? Yeah, so who you're seeing right there is actually a very important person in uh, our organization. That's Uriah True Chang, and he's a Hoopa Valley tribal member, and he's actually the youngest Ancestral Guard board member. And so when we started the Ancestral Guard, um, I was about 17 years old, and all everybody else, the original members were about 12, you know, 13. Uh -huh. 14 and we'd actually get together and um, we were one of the only self-sustaining youth programs in Del Norte County. And that's not saying that we didn't struggle because we all did cultural presentations. We did fish cookouts, we did fundraisers, we did everything we did needed to do to get to the next meeting. And we were youth doing this. And so um, today we're a nonprofit organization. And as we move forward, we think it's important to uh, include this younger generation because a lot of people when they ask about the ancestral guard someone once actually said why do the ancestors need to be protected and I said well we're we're not protecting the ancestors of the past what we're doing is we're protecting this indigenous mindset and we're passing it on to the ancestors of the future because the children that you see today and one day they're going to be somebody's ancestors and the children that they're going to have are going to be someone's ancestors so we want to be able to keep this mindset and pass it on to future generations and that's where the concept of the ancestral guard came to be. Thank you so much. Um, so Cody and Marlena, you all are also doing work specifically in food sovereignty in your own uh, lives, both with like at a community level, but also in your schooling. Is there anything that you can reflect on from the film as far as being youth and students and the work that you wanna do? Was there things that stuck with you or things that you thought people should highlight or really take away with them as they think about this movement, uh, both in California, but also in general? And either one of you can jump in. For me personally, something that really stuck out to me in the movie was um, talking about the, the longing for these foods and that the, the healing it brings. Um, and that really that through our indigenous foods, you know, economy, culture, spirituality, health, you know, body and mind, they're all interly connected through this. And it is um, through this that it defines us. You know, I, in my own personal life, my tribe has experienced assimilation for hundreds of years to the point where growing up, one of the only ways my family remained traditional was through our traditional foods. And it's actually what has brought me back into my traditional ways and my family. Those foods have spiked my interest in coming back to my culture, which you, which I saw in this movie, you know, and they talked about and very much felt, you know, through my love of blueberries and salmon, you know, I've, I found a career path. I found a life path. I found a spiritual path. I found a cultural path. And it's, it's been so rewarding, you know, and to be able to experience it and be around so many amazing people 
that are doing the same work is awe-inspiring. Yeah, I just kind of have to echo some of the things Cody said, but also just honoring our relatives within this movie and honoring Sammy and Twyla and, you know, our other relatives, Fred and Elsie, you know, continuing on doing the good work um, that we should be doing as Indigenous peoples, um, especially in regards to protecting our Tamayo, our Mother Earth, um, and our relatives. Um, you know, I, I reflect you know, the movie was amazing and it was really well done. And it's all I hear from everybody that is watching it. Um, and so when I reflect, I just think of like how Yawaiwish are beautiful in our language it is. Um, you know, with one pick of a berry or harvest of a plant relative or throw of a net or, you know, hunt of Shukit, the deer, we're able to connect to this whole cycle, you know, feeling empowered as the next generation embracing, you know, our ancient lineage and, and carrying on, um, you know, what creator instructed us to do. And especially in regards to, you know, what Sammy spoke of, um, you know, within my own um, practice and as indigenous peoples, you know, we're to, we're to pass that on to the next generation. So I do a lot of work with youth as well. Um, and, and just giving them information and knowledge that I have and carry or have gotten from our elders in, in terms of plant relatives and, and sustaining and managing um, our Tamayo, our earth. Um, and also I think of um, language, you know, as an important piece of our reclamation of food sovereignty, but also our languages. Um, you know, the eco side of our lands is the primary reason why um, I, I obtained my undergraduate degree, but also I'm pursuing my graduate degree. Um, you know, those specific threats um, to our relatives, um, commodification, foreign agriculture, private and commercial development, you know, these are detrimental effects that have, um, you know, on our ecological systems and our life ways. As Sammy mentioned, you know, the dams on the Klamath River, um, our people down where I come from, um, from the southern regions of this occupied territory, um, you know, our Wanicha, our river, um, was dammed and, and, and also canaled, and our people were the ones that dug that canal and diverted our river to the cities below us because of, you know, the industrial, industrial revolution, as Sammy mentioned in the movie, um, which has brought detrimental effects um, to our foods. And so that's something that I, I deem to focus on within my research, but also highlight um, you know, the collective knowledge and empowerment that our people are doing right now. Um, and also, you know, uplifting our people by reclaiming traditional food systems and ancestral ways. Um, and so I just, I got so much from it and I've worked, I actually got to meet Twyla um, at the Good Health and Wellness Conference for CDC, which me and my partner um, worked on uh, two years ago. My partner is actually from the local region. His name's Bubba Riggins. He's Hufa Yurok. And it just makes me feel so good when I watch these films because like um, our connection to our relatives, Sammy is a cousin of, of uh, my partner and so is the youth that Sammy spoke of. Um, and it, it just like, that gives me so much power to see the next generations and that lineage and be carried on, you know, within and even here within our own people, so. Now, just a reminder, if people have questions, they can type them into the chat. I will take an opportunity to ask the panelists more questions and follow up. Um, this is actually a question that comes from uh, someone who watched the film and submitted a question. They were actually wondering if there are opportunities in Klamath for learning and experiencing cooking um, or food sovereignty, I guess, in general. I don't know if... Uh, Sammy, if you want to speak to that, if there's opportunities for like learning and experiencing cooking in the Klamath region. Did we lose him? I think we might have. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for him to log back in. Um, and then the next question was also submitted by an audience member. Uh, are there any updates about the Food Sovereignty Lab at Humboldt State and what that is and what that will look like? We actually have a lot of really good updates with the Food Sovereignty Lab. Um, um, both Marlena and I um, and Kutcha are a part of the steering committee for it. And right now what we're focused on is the creation of the physical space. Um, and so we've actually, we petitioned for the space that we wanted on HSU's campus 
and eventually got it, but actually got it through um, student activism because uh, originally we were denied, but now we have had the official go ahead after we've gotten the support of the AS um, student body and now we also are um, making our way into the academic student plan for the next um, upcoming school years and we also have just put out our first draft of what the floor plan is going to look like. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening with it and if you'd like to donate um, I'm sure Kutcha can throw in the chat link there um, where you can go to donate specifically for the Food Sovereignty Lab at HSU, which hopefully soon will be a place for, uh, which it will be a place soon for local community involvement, like, you know, learning how to cook with local resources and how you can connect to these lands and local foods and peoples. And if there are people on the call who don't know about the the history of the Food Sovereignty Lab. Uh, Cody, do you want to give like a very brief overview of how that came to be? Yeah, of course. Um, so really how the Food Sovereignty was born was through a class project in Kucha's um, Natural Resource and Management um, class, Native American Studies class. And really what it was is the goal of the class was to have a project that had lasting impacts that actually, you know, gave back to our community it wasn't just going to be some paper we wrote. Um, Native American studies at Humboldt State is very um, project driven um, in general. And so we really started just deciding, you know, we wanted to see what representation there was on HSU's campus. And we also, uh, for Native Americans and Indigenous peoples, and we also wanted to um, interview students, faculty, staff, and community members, tribal members um, from local tribes. And um, we ended up finding that a really big demand through our research was um, traditional foods and traditional medicine and cultural practices of that nature and to have a physical space for that and to have um, an educational component that was interdisciplinary. So we actually, um, took all these aspects through our research that we found like a native plants garden, um, you know, cooking techniques, drying techniques, a salmon smoking pit, um, preparation space. Uh, we took all these suggestions and we worked them into this lab space. And really it's, you know, been in the making for a little over a year, a year now, I think, close to. And, uh, it's slowly taken a lot of like really cool form. We took the research to a student research competition um, and actually took away second place in behavioral studies. We um, have a lot of really great momentum with this project and it's going to be a really um, amazing project that also involves all the different colleges of HSU and will be interdisciplinary bringing in multiple majors and studies. Uh, to hopefully better inform all the everyone's education on indigenous foods and sovereignty. Thank you, Cody. Um, Sammy, we had a question for you earlier, which is, do you know of any uh, opportunities in the Klamath region for um, learning about like traditional cooking or traditional foods that people can follow up on? Well, first of all, I think it's, um we have to think about the people who do these things. What does their access to these resources look like? And when we want people to learn about it, we have to look at to, you know, respecting the people that do these things and making sure that they have access to land and access to resource to do these things. And if we do this, and if we focus on things um, like, you know, like, like, like re-energizing these relationships that indigenous people have with the land and doing all we can to do so, then we will see more opportunities arise more naturally in an organic way. We have to really be able to, um, for instance, I always tell people if, if like for me, for instance, I will never talk about something that doesn't affect me personally. And when it comes to uh, food sovereignty, food sovereignty, you know, it's something that we use to communicate what we're actually doing with other people. But in reality, what food sovereignty means is that we're making sure that the people that we love, um, that we see every day, the people that we care about and care about us on our top mirror are actually having access to healthy food and vegetables and what's that look like and finding out how do we do that. I believe this is where um, we will start to gain more access 
for other people to have opportunities to learn about traditional foods. So in reality, just get connected with your um, local people and do all you can to make sure that these opportunities are happening in the community. We have to learn from each other, so. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, this is a question for anyone on the panel. Is there some way that you'd like to reflect for people who are listening why food sovereignty is so important right now and why there is an urgency to this and an importance to this type of movement and what it really means for tribal peoples and communities or, or why people should really kind of understand the sort of importance and centrality of this, of this movement and this issue right now? If there's anything people want to reflect on for those who are listening. I think if we want to talk about the importance of it in relevance to COVID-19 um, closures and the economy and food systems and everything that we've seen ultimately that is crumbling because of an industrialized complex that has been perpetuating these westernized values. And so right now, indigenous peoples are hit proportionally much harder by these diseases and even historically have been very traumatic for us. Smallpox um, historically has been incredibly traumatic and devastating for indigenous populations. And it started off as cowpox, which came from poorly managed um, beef systems, you know, food systems, you know. And so the relevance of food sovereignty now is not only important for our health, but it is for also like our economy, our spirituality, and our well being. Um, I think some of the things, especially like currently that we're facing, although we've faced all kinds of issues um, in terms of food sovereignty from the past till now, um, one particular thing that I guess I'd like to hit on is talking about cultural burning and what we're experiencing right now in our lands um, with 3.3 million acres being completely burned by colonial wildfires. And notice how I say colonial um, because these aren't cultural fires. These aren't low intensity burns that are regenerating um, our traditional foods, um, cooling our rivers. Um, we're seeing, you know, exacerbated amounts of climate change um, more than ever. Um, and so I think the urgency has always been there um, and has always been you know, our food sovereignty has always been a threat, but you know, we're seeing these times that climate change is continue to further exacerbate things, but also policy and management, um, not allowing our indigenous people to manage in the ways that we've been advocating for. As Sammy mentioned, you know, activists and our elders who have been working on these issues tirelessly for years and years and years. Um, you know, and I, I look at it in terms of my own family um, and reclaiming that cultural knowledge. Although I grew up with some, you know, from my grandparents, um, my grandfather was, um, you know, came from the boarding school era and things that were taken from him um, and told him not to practice, you know? And so with this reclamation um, of culture and food sovereignty, you know, stories from my own grandfather have been coming out that I haven't heard, you know, my whole entire life. And I've spent a lot of time with my grandparents, you know? And so, you know, this reclamation is an urgency can be in a negative light, but it's also empowering in the ways that we are reclaiming our culture and our traditional values and management as the younger generation. Um, you know, Sammy hit on that, like our grandparents weren't able to do these things. Um, and, and now looking at my nieces and my nephews and the younger generation, you know, I'm able to help be a vessel. I'm never going to be, um, you know, the I feel like I'm never going to be that expert. Um, one of our elders says, you know, we're always learning. We'll always be learning. Um, and so I think the urgency is, you know, being able to pass that on to our next generation, but also having a place to be able to do that in. I believe, um, for me, I'm a fisherman. And this year, I've spent more time planting vegetables and harvesting vegetables in the garden than I have fishing for salmon on the river. This affects me mentally, affects me physically, affects my um, everything about my life. But it's made me reflect and think about, even though I'm not on the river fishing, the very soil that oh, we're using is from the high plains 
of the Klamath River. So this river is still nourishing the crops that we're using to feed families. And that's one thing I think about is you have to live it. When, it's, when food sovereignty, you know, we can talk about it, we can explain it, you know, everything, but we have to start living it ourselves and, you know, leading that example for our people in our community and creating these opportunities for people to get involved because that's where we're going to find uh, true health or the benefic benefits of food sovereignty is when our people are actually implementing the resources that we've been developed. I mean, if you think about it, over the one thing that we do is we do Victorious Gardens Initiative, where we say um, we worked with uh, UC Berkeley's uh, Food Ways of the Future program, and where we found out while in Southern Northern California food ways, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars are wrapped up into community gardens, and how much money has been spent into community gardens, and how much of those resources are actually reaching the community people that they're des that they're supposed to be reaching, and how many people are getting burnt out when all that responsibility is buried onto a couple people. So what we have to go is go beyond these colonial and new um, systems. And we have to look at the indigenous food ways like privatized gardens that families had and shared and being able to, for families to have an opportunity to grow their own food. How do we make this happen? You know, And that's what we're looking at today with our gardens, our Victorious Gardens Initiative. What we're doing is that we're gonna be implementing uh, small culture beds outside of families' houses. And so that way they only have to water their garden, you know, a couple of times a week rather than every day. We're going to be providing them with fresh starts so they have organic vegetables to start with. And we're going to be providing uh, one once a week, somebody will come around to tend the gardens and we'll be able to talk to them about the gardens and also answer any questions that they have. You know, getting these opportunities to the people is the most important thing about food sovereignty initiatives. And that's where we have to start putting our resources. That's where we have to start putting our time and our energy. Uh, we do have a question in the chat, which is, um, can, can any of the panelists reflect on how you may or may not have noticed an impact to the things that you gather or hunt or fish due to climate changes? Are seasons different now than what you were taught? Are things changing as they're things that you're noticing being practitioners who work uh, with, with these relatives right on the ground? Well, one thing that I like to say is that, you know, well, as a fisherman, when I'm on the river, I've spent most of my life in a boat before, you know, I was able to walk, I was in a boat. And when you're fishing on the water and you go from generations of people who are catching, you know, hundreds of salmon to a generation of people who spend all day on the river hoping to catch one salmon, you hear a lot of people talk and express themselves what they think and a lot of people say global warming and everybody's kind of like oh yeah but no that's a major thing that's happening that's affecting our people or in our salmon especially on the ocean side of things but it's the corporate greed that is taking a hold of our food systems and our ability for indigenous people to live healthy lifestyles such as over around like what is it 40 to 60 percent of the trinity river is sucked down south and put into the hands of private uh, water bankers. I mean, they, and they, there's this narrative that pits fishermen versus farmers, when in reality, it's not fishermen versus farmers, because there's enough water in the Klamath Basin to provide for every human being and animal living within it. But California is using it as a bank to fund this next generation of water brokers and millionaires and private corporations. And so these are things we have to acknowledge and we have to talk about. And it hurts because in this systems that we live in today, this colonial based systems, everything um, affects the indigenous people because everything that these cities and you know, societies are built on has been built on the backs of people of color. And even, even our you know, traditional items that are in museums, you know, when we look at these things, how are a lot of these things appropriated in the proper manner? Are you know, our indigenous people have access to these things? And we, I would just wish that more people respected indigenous people as they respected you know, traditional knowledge and traditional tools and traditional you know literature so i don't know i can say um in alaska we've experienced uh climate change immensely and exponentially harder than many regions of the world uh and even in my short life i've experienced huge differences in you know, the availability of the land, what it can yield, you know, berries are smaller, they come earlier, 
uh, salmon in just my mother's generation have been lost. You know, they, they used to say you could walk on the backs of s salmon across a river. And uh, even hearing stories of, from my mother's generation and her mother's generation of how one of our biggest traditional foods and culturally important uh, species, the caribou, is pretty much no longer existent in our traditional lands as Denina people. And we use the, uh, caribou for clothing and everything. And so we've had to adapt and now we move to moose leather, you know, because the availability of moose and moose with climate change have actually get, been increasing in numbers and also because we've been taking down top predators and things like that. But in my, in my short life, I've seen a change in everything. I've seen a change in when the uh, one of the biggest, you know, most people in Alaska know this, whether they're native or not, but when the fireweed turn, when they turn to cotton, you know, you only have, th you know, two more weeks of summer. And, you know, that seems to come earlier and earlier every year. Yeah, and it's just, it's devastating. It's, it's truly devastating to see these changes happening in like my traditional lands that my family has never been removed from. You know, we are resilient, we are strong, we are, we're there still, you know, we remain and we will continue, but we have to adapt and we have to learn and grow. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think about it. I always think like, you know, we have this, like we're the longest running research project, right? Of like, we're able to, to be in our land like our whole lives in that way but also just you know I think about my own homelands and um, things that have changed the ecology drastically you know I spoke about our Juanita our river being diverted and dug by our own people um, and not by choice um, and those and our river was diverted to the city, two cities below us um, Escondido and Vista or so it's called now um, and just like Cody said, in my short time here on this earth, um, you know, I've, I've seen throughout my life the effects of not having our waterway, um, our, our vein um, to our people. And it's affected us tremendously, um, especially with our health um, as they spoke in the film. But also in regards to the ecology, um, our herds and our plant relatives, um, and in particular, you know, our quila or our oak, um, they're very sick and they're sick from the oak borer um, coming and taking out a lot of our oak trees, which just thinks our people, um, the acorn, right? And so what we see in, in the southern regions of this land is, although Northern California has really reclaimed this cultural burning um, in managing um, Southern California because of management and suppression, um, and also a uh, buildup of fuels like chaparral um, have made it extremely hard to put fire back on the ground because of the buildup, but also just people being scared in general from these colonial wildfires. But it's something that we must have on the landscape in order for our food to thrive and especially our acorns. This land was um, managed by fire all throughout by many different tribes um, had this practice. And so that's what I've seen in my own lifetime is gathering acorns. You know, there's a lot more buggy acorns. It's hard for us to find acorns that are, are nice and clean because that's not the way that it's managed by the Forest Service. Um, or we even look now because of so much rain that we got in the past year, within my whole lifetime, I've never seen a fish in our waterway. And we got so much rain in uh, two years ago my nieces and nephews, I remember, I, I took them on a walk through the riverbed because for so long, that's all we had was our riverbed. No water flowing through it. Underground, yes, but I'd take them and they'd, I'd say, this is our river, you know, this is who we are as a people. And they'd say, this is sand, you know, this is, we're standing on sand. And, and then two years ago, I came home to visit and they come running and they're like, there's dead fish all along the river. And I, and I was just like, fish, I never even seen a fish. There was never even enough water to flow through for any fish to come through. But because of how much rain we got with climate change, it had pushed fish from the upper headwaters through um, into Rincon where my mother's house is. And 
you know, it wasn't enough water to push them all through the ocean. So what did they do? They just end up on the banks of our riverbed. But it, not in my whole life have I ever seen that, but it came one rain of a season and it brought fish and my nieces and nephews were like, we have fish. Did you know we have fish? Did you know there was fish here? And, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's also empowering because, you know, our, like, like my, the next generation we keep talking about, you know, we were all taught, I'm, I'm sure by everybody speaking by our elders, you know, and, and so it just gives me so much hope um, that they're able to pay attention to the same things that we're seeing because this is what, sur you know, we survive on. Um, and so I think that's like, you know, some of like what I had to add to the um, question. So thank you. So uh, what are you all excited about? What are the movements and the moments, the organizations or the projects or the things that you know about that you're really excited about that you think people here on this, um, in this talk should know about in, that exist in this world that can be this region, it can be California, it can be just even bigger. What, as, as the generation that's coming up, kind of making these things happen, what are you the most excited to highlight about what's happening right now in food sovereignty? Um, I think for me uh, to highlight, and I didn't speak directly to this, but a portion of my project that I'll be working on and I've been working on even outside of um, uh, school is there is a collective um, of Paiukuishams that we've come together and reclaimed 325 acres of our ancestral territory. Um, and so what we're looking to do is um, reestablish this land for our people to make a viable source for food sovereignty. Um, like I said, in the southern region, we see more and more um, uh, you know, building of housing developments that are um, that really put our foods at threat. Um, and so we've noticed this, as I said, as growing up in our ancestral territory. And so we've been talking about this as youth. And so we were able to buy back 325 acres um, in uh, Paiukuisham ancestral territory, but also known as Hemet. Um, and so that's something that I find a lot of power in. Um, we've brought in youth out to um, our lands and are reclaiming um, our culture in that way. So that's something I'm really excited um, for our own community and also working um, on the tribal practices grant that I work with. There's like 50 collaborators within our region. And so it makes me really feel really empowered um, that so many people, um, even if they didn't grow up with, um, you know, cultural uh, and traditional ways of prepping food or being on the land, you know, it's, it's being revived and people are finding that good medicine and any energy in their hearts to um, reclaim that practice. One thing, one thing I'm uh, proud about and looking forward to is just like eating dinner tonight. I mean, we just cooked up some salmon on redwood sticks. I started with my uh, friend Zach, Zach Rye Gable, who's a youth leadership in our program. And then I had to walk away because I almost was late to the Zoom. And, you know, I had that confidence that they could finish that meal. And we're here with our family. We're up here with the Pennington family and Rita and everybody. And we're, we're, we just harvested corn from a garden that Nat and his family, they committed to growing for families on the lower Klamath River. And it's this kind of unity in bringing families together is really what I'm excited about to seeing. Um, also, I gotta give a shout out to these guys because the programming that we've been developing for the last three years under our uh, Victorious Garden Initiative is finally becoming to fruition because we, are, we have this garden that we've developed but also we're giving the opportunity to build a mobile butcher station and um, a whole commercial stainless steel grade and be able, and by this time next year, we'll have that. And we're going to be building 10 smokers and we acquired property. My brother, John Luke, who has seven acres on the Klamath River, who allowed us to build these gardens at 21, well, you know, own his land, have that farm and our other brothers and everybody coming together, just making these opportunities available and seeing that in our communities, like for instance, a Yurok tribe, um, Louisa McCovey, she has been working so hard and bringing everybody together to make these opportunities, you know. And this is what this is what it's all about. You see, we got everybody here: is John, Luke, and Zach, my and Peter. Everybody, we're about to eat some dinner. There's Amber and her little baby Cora and Natty P in the back. And that's what it's all about. It's all about family, you know.
something I'm really excited personally for um, my tribe and um, many of the tribes in Alaska is that we've seen a resurgence of um, our youth coming back to the villages um, educated, whereas a few generations ago they were being sent, to, youth were being sent away, not even a few generations ago, just one generation ago, youth were being sent away to boarding schools and losing their culture and their spirituality and their traditional foods. Whereas now we see a reclaiming of that. Um, and through reclaiming those traditional foods, we also reclaim our culture, our songs, our dances, you know, and it's, it's so wonderful to see that and to share that and to have that community around me because for so, as long as I can think of food was always community food was family and that relationship in is how we teach the next generation too and inform them inform them and the place their ancestors come from and so through reclaiming our food sovereignty we reclaim our culture and it informs us as people and as indigenous people and it's it's thrilling really to be a part of i'm going to share a few quick things for everyone in the chat in case um to know some really awesome things I think we could be really excited about. If you uh, are interested, this is actually a project that is done by Native youth. Um, they have created these uh, really amazing food snacks called Acorn Bites, which you can purchase that actually support the work that they do as Native youth through the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, it's a chance to eat food that they make that they've like, um, uh, that they've like, thought about and really utilized and um, they work on and then this supports their native food sovereignty program for youth in uh, the Santa Rosa region and expanding from there. Uh, this is actually the link to the um, Chia Cafe Collective, which I don't know, Marlena, if you want to add a little bit about the Chia Cafe Collective. I'm also going to put a link to the Chia Cafe Collective cookbook which I think Marlena can tell you a little bit more about, but if you're interested in having an indigenous foods cookbook from California, we make many recipes out of there for Sunday fun day. Um, but Marlena, if you wanna talk a little bit about the Chia Cafe Collective, that's also something to be really excited about. Yeah, and so the Chia Cafe Collective is a collective of different California natives um, and some in non-California natives, but indigenous people. Um, and it's a great collective. I've actually worked with a lot of them. I, I work, uh, I see a lot of them as my aunties and uncles in that way. Um, but they have an awesome cookbook um, in which I have cooked most of the recipes, which is pretty awesome um, with them. But it's all traditional foods um, within it. And uh, a lot of the people do a lot of great work within our communities. Um, also how I've gotten connected uh, with the Chia Cafe Collective is they actually started doing workshops within our community, but also I attended the Idlewild Arts Institute, which is right above um, our ancestral territory. And so they actually give cooking classes um, to native youth there on their campus. And so I was able to go and learn a lot from them, but they do a lot of great work within California. So I recommend uh, their cookbook and also supporting their collective. Yeah, I just wanted to um, show you guys some food sovereignty and, and, and true form right here. We have all local foods here from everything on this potato tray with the carrots and stuff. And we got the salmon going on and some corn fresh from the garden. We all came together to make this happen. So and there is, even got baby core in the back. <laughs> Can we like Indian door dash that, Sammy? <laughs> Marlena, do you want to share, if, uh, just off the top of your head, do you have any favorite recipes from the Chia Cafe Collective cookbook? Um, okay, so one of them that's in there for sure, acorn dumplings. Bomb. Very delicious. Um, but I've actually made those before they were in the book, so that was pretty cool. Um, and let's see, what else is in there? Uh, they actually have like a mesquite quail. Oh my gosh, that's really tasty too. I've made that. It's like barbecue mesquite quail. Oh, nettle soup. Someone put that in there too. Yeah, that's my go-to. Um, so nettle in our language is shakishla. Um, and so I love to make nettle soup with pine nuts. And that's a really good, easy recipe that's in there. Not, not as easy to gather, I will let you know, as someone who had to climb down a hill on the side of Trinidad to get nettles. Um, but 
really nice to cook and eat. Um, I also wanted to include a link here to uh, Wapipa's Kitchen. This is a place where if you'd like, you can also order some of the foods that she puts up, which are indigenous foods. Right now she's actually selling uh, wild rice bars and chocolate choke cherry bars that people can order and have sent to them in the mail. It helps to support her as an indigenous chef. She's also a caterer who goes all around and does events that are all indigenous foods. Um, and she makes a, like a lavender rice cookie that I like crave constantly. Um, that is amazing. And also if you're interested in another cookbook and somebody doing a lot of work in food sovereignty, um, Sean Sherman, the sous chef, he has a full on indigenous kitchen cookbook that you can purchase, which is an amazing like a uh, compilation of recipes that he has made as a professional chef. And he also helps to support other businesses and things, especially native businesses where they are trying to start um, building like food sovereignty through restaurants. And he, right now they are working on the launching of the Tatanka truck, which is a, um, uh, food truck that they're working on for indigenous foods. So uh, there's a lot that's happening and that could happen that could we could continue to build even in our own region. But I like to highlight that there are native peoples throughout these areas that are really doing this work to kind of think about new ways to connect to food and food sovereignty. Um, a last question from the, an audience member. Uh, as someone in academia who is non-native but has strong interest in collaborating with indigenous communities to enforce food sovereignty and lifeways along the coast, are there any suggestions for how to get involved with food sovereignty? Yeah. Can you give me a call? Um, <laughs> Sammy Jensaw, give me an email. We'll give you my... Um, information and we can really connect you there's you know opportunities all the way around and if you're looking to get a hold of us or you know work with us too please just feel up reach out um you know we'll answer some questions and yeah that's the best way also i want to do while i have everybody's attention i also wanted to give a little shout out to uh right here our ancestral guards very own media director and bell who's going to be going around and leading our uh, community scientists as doing our community uh, research project. They make these bracelets here and they're all local ingredients. They braid the, braid the bear grass themselves and they're selling these on Fishbone Trade Company on Instagram or just go ahead and get a hold of us and support indigenous artists and people whenever you can. I definitely like to mirror, mirror what Sammy just said about supporting local indigenous artists and anything, any, any way you can, um, through your wallet, through um, your, your dedication, through your time, really get involved and try to learn more about your local indigenous peoples and how they continue to work in stewardship with the land. And then you can also just to like be simple is to start a, your own garden you know, learn to like get closer to your foods and learn to get closer to the foods of the land, but in a sustainable but managed way. Uh, so we do have a question coming in <coughs> that says, this year it seems there's been a rise in the number of people moving here. This summer was crazy in Trinidad, more so than in the past. Is there a plan to educate newcomers on treading on the land? I think that's something that, along with climate change that happens, more and more people are gonna be pressing north. More and more people are going to see our beautiful area and they're gonna to wanna to live here and move here. And I think it is important for these people to learn um, about indigenous people, not only learn about indigenous people, but build healthy relationships with indigenous people. And we have to think about, do your part to make sure that the parks are working healthy relationships with indigenous people and making sure that all around, um, we have the opportunity to share that culture, that knowledge, that craft with anybody who we, you know, who we want to. And 
that's the main thing is that we just have to respect people as human beings and respect indigenous people as a you know, natural part of this ecological system. You know, I think one thing I would really add to is that in this region, we have a very active native community who are constantly holding all kinds of events and outreach moments and building media and building a presence. I don't think it's hard in Humboldt and Del Norte County to find native spaces where native peoples are doing really amazing work. And people are constantly asking me, like, what can I do to support native communities? And I always say, show up to our things and show that there is a real interest in what we're doing, whether that be our talks or our outreach moments, our, our events, like show up and be present, especially when we invite people and we're saying this is a public event make sure you're there because that shows us that the work that we're doing is important to people, but it also is always an educational opportunity. And as the people who are living in this region, it is now, now that you've connected with indigenous peoples and they have shared with you their knowledge and experiences, it's now your responsibility to tell other people that they need to do that too. And to say like, it is, yes, you do need to know more about the indigenous peoples in this region. And I always say to people, you can sign up for classes at Humboldt State and Native American Studies. You can watch all of the YouTube videos that Native people make that they put on to sort of teach people about this region and beyond. You can read their research. Uh, the work that the students who have gone through um, Humboldt State uh, on theses, they are publicly published, right? You can read the books of the Native authors in this region. Um, and you can start to say like you really support the work that we're doing. There's all kinds of information out there. It's now up to people to start holding people accountable to that information. So um, we're almost out of time. So I did want to say that if you want to put thank yous or appreciation words into the chat, that's always very helpful for speakers. If they can hear from people, the impact that they've made, sometimes it's hard to tell, especially on Zoom, especially right now like where people are at or what affected them or what they're gonna take with them. So if you wanna reflect a little bit on, hey, this is the thing that I learned and I, I really appreciate this. I wanna remind everyone that the people on this panel are, are young people. They are the people who are doing this work now and they're using their energy and their time and their efforts and their thoughts to think about how they wanna make the community better and how they want their future to be better because they're the ones seeing what is going, like they're seeing what happens now and then how that's gonna affect the future. And they really are trying to build a better future. So I, I am so appreciative of their vision in that and also their energy. And I will say, I love working with young people because of their energy and their ability to really step up in moments when you are feeling like tired uh, in all of the work that you have to do. But I also wanna remind people that the, the issues that were talked about in this film, they are not um, over. They are still continuing. This is, not a, this is not a solved problem. This is a growing thing that we have to be in consideration of. And so if you wanna know how to support people, uh, you do need to support the movements that they are working on. And in our region, that's really about dam removal. And that's really about how we protect our fish and our water because we can't solve I always say to people, you cannot solve climate change if we still have dams. It's just not going to work. And I, at, at this point, that's where we're at with the research. That's where we're at with the people who understand like how this all works together in an ecosystem. So these are things that people are still working tirelessly on to protect our food sovereignty and our futures. And it's happening all over the world. I want you to also be mindful that the fish wars that were featured in the film they are not new in terms of people trying to stop native people from practicing their, their rights to hunting, fishing and gathering. And they continue to this day in Canada right now. Uh, people of um, the Mi'kmaq tribes are fighting to have a right to their traditional fishing. And there are people in boats trying to stop them, trying to tear apart their traps, trying to commit violence to stop them from being able to do that. So you're seeing how these types of issues continue throughout the world. Uh, there's a lot to be excited about, but there's so much to be mindful of as we walk through this world. Indigenous peoples always are, um, are working toward 
what they can see as better futures for everyone. And they really want to think about like, what does that look like? And how does that come from the lessons that we've always been given since the beginning of time? So I thank everyone for joining us. I wanna thank everyone for leaving messages in the chat for the speakers to look at. Um, and I will say like, reach out if you have further questions, donate to the things that you've learned about, buy the foods that you've seen, because those show people that these movements are important too. And any amount, if you're thinking of donating anything, any amount helps because when you are doing this work on the ground and you get a $5 donation from someone, that can sustain you for the whole day that somebody cares enough to try to do something, right? Uh, if, you, if we get more likes on Facebook, if we see more watches on this, like these are the things that help to remind us that we're not just doing this all by ourselves. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and as we say in Hoopa, which is this good thing we've done together. I'm going to like take it with me. So thank you. Do you want to stop recording, uh, Dana or Katie?